I'll well, just good evening. Um, I want to basically begin in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. I seek protection in God from Satan, the accursed. I think we all basically should do that. Seek protection in God constantly and persistently from Satan, from the evil one, from the evil inclinations. I want to thank uh, the good Reverend Furi. I was driving through the area yesterday and I decided to pop by and meet him and just see this beautiful church. I don't know how old this church is, but I would assume it's been around for some time in South Africa. 100 years old? 1899. 1899. Wow. I assumed it was <laughs> older than 100 years old. Um, and so it's amazing that it's, it's basically a privilege to stand here and share a few things from you, uh, from my perspective. Um, I want to basically uh, state a certain uh, you know, disclaimers. I am by no means a scholar. I am basically a student, a student in religion. Um, I take it upon myself to engage in interfaith discussion and dialogue with various groups and individuals and people from different facets of life. And I think it's important in this um, hostile environment that we find ourselves in to basically talk to each other, to understand each other, to engage and interact with each other. I think for too long, and particularly in the climate in which we are living, there is an inherent fear of the other. We are fearful of the other. We are basically viewing the other in negative light with negative stereotypes. And so from that perspective, it's important that we have these interactive sessions so that we know where we come from. We don't have to agree on theology. We don't have to agree on our theological uh, differences that in fact exist. But there are certain fund fundamental truths that exist that we can basically share with each other on truth, on morality, on justice, because we see a lot of injustice. We see a lot of hate. We see a lot of evil in the world today. We see a lot of violence in the world. And how do we as religious communities and faith leaders come together and harness and utilize the best in our faiths and use it to uplift the rest of society, the rest of community. And so in the time period afforded, we're probably going to explore some of these issues and um, hopefully have a fruitful discussion. Now, how do we start this discussion? I would like to basically share a few thoughts with the congregation here. We are in a world where we find ourselves in a, in, enmeshed in a multiplicity of uh, various worldviews, various religions, um, and so, how do we interact with each other? If we basically look at the definition of religion, Max Muller, he wrote a, in the 1800s, or I think the early part of the 1800s, he wrote a collection of books called The Sacred Books of the East, and he translated a whole range of religious literature, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, uh, chapters and portions of the Quran, and so on. And he entitled his compendium, The Sacred Books of the East. But in defining religion generally, because we live in a religious and indeed a secular community, he states that religion comes from the Latin religio, originally used to mean a reverence for God or the gods, or in many instances, a careful pondering of divine things. Now, conventionally, when we talk about monotheism, because at a primary level, Christianity can, in fact, claim to be monotheistic. At, at, a, at a basic root level, you obviously subscribe to the idea that there is indeed one God, and we, in fact, believe in one God. And the Quran, in fact, exhorts us to say, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, come to common terms as between us and you that we worship none but one God. Now, conventionally speaking, when you look at the monotheistic uh, faiths out there, you can conventionally identify them as Judaism, as Christianity, and as Islam in the kind of prophetic um, trajectory that these particular faiths evolved. And one of the common denominators is that we in fact believe, or at least um, exhort to the idea that there is in fact only one God, that there is only one God that exists. But that is being challenged in today's society with an extreme form of secularism and an aggressive form of atheism. I mean, if you go to the bookshop down the road here, I think there, there was a library some years back. I used to come regularly to the Musgrave Library as a kid. It's no longer here. I don't know where it's gone to. Uh, but if you go to your average library, your average bookshop, what books hit you? Richard Dawkins, 
the late Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris. And these books are ideologically against all forms of religion, all monotheistic worldviews, which they view as inherently oppressive, as inherently flawed, as inherently wrong in its entire makeup. So how do we, on the one hand, we as religious communities face this onslaught of fundamentalist secularism and radical aggressive atheism. And on the other hand, we are also faced with this, religious extremism. Religious extremism in all forms, where people basically take this us and them approach. Um, you're going to hell, I'm going to paradise. This, this, this absolute this dogmatism from both perspectives needs to be confronted. And in tonight's discussion, we're going to explore and see whether we can in fact find a middle way in terms of creating some degree of balance where we can agree to disagree, we're going to argue till the cows come home, agree to disagree, and of course use some of our essential tenets in our faiths to uplift those around us and those who are in need of um, spiritual thirst. How do we define Islam? Because that's what the good reverend wanted me to discuss. He said that a lot of the congregants here would like to know more about religion, more about Islam. At the outset, <clears throat> from the Holy Quran, God or Allah is viewed as the Lord of the worlds. Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. It identifies, so if you want to talk about dimensions, not just galaxies and universe, but perhaps different dimensions, he's the Lord of all the worlds. And he has not discriminated between nations in sending his revelations. He has raised prophets with his messages amongst the nations of the globe. And that was a message of peace acquired through submission to God's will. And in Arabic, that is basically Islam. Now, here's the argument from the Quranic point of view. The Quran would, for example, say, cursorily, if you open it, you'd read a verse which says, There never was a people without a warner having lived amongst them. And had another verse, To every nation have we sent a guide. The argument from the Quranic point of view is that if God Almighty, call him Yahweh, call him Allah, if God Almighty is not partial with regards to his material blessings, his food, his shelter, nourishment, materially at least, why should he then be partial with regards to his spiritual blessings? And the answer is that he has not been partial. Therefore, if you look at the studies and the works of anthropologists, when you look at each and every single nation on earth, at some level, there is some a sort of obeisance or um, some form of recognition of a higher supreme being. And from the Islamic perspective, we would argue that these nations that have some concept of God or some concept of the divine, at some point in time in history or prehistorically, were in fact sent messengers or were recipients of a divine message with the same universal call for the oneness of God and for monotheism. And you find this again and again in the Quran. To give you an example, Surah 10, verse 57, to every people we have sent an apostle. Surah 25, verse 24, verily we, meaning God, that's a royal plural. As the Anglican church, you do understand the notion of the royal plural. We, not many gods, one God, have sent thee in truth as a bearer of glad tidings, as a warner, and there never was a people without a warner having lived amongst them. Again, going back to my original argument. And then it goes on, um, I think Surah 42, verse 13. The same religion, and the word in Arabic is deen. Deen conventionally has been translated as religion, but it's actually more than just simply religion. But for purposes of convenience, religion. The same religion has he established for you as that which he has enjoined on Noah, that which we have sent by revelation to thee, Muhammad, and that which we enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus so you should remain steadfast in faith and make no divisions therein. So look at the claim that it is making. At the outset, the claim is universalist in nature. It's not somehow some, a new kind of, a new foreign cult that is somehow coming up, but the Quran is making the claim that what is now revealed to the Arabs, this backward community engaging in sanguinary warfare, is now the same message that was sent down to nations before. From that perspective, we would then argue that Abraham was a Muslim and the faith and the religion he preached was Islam. 
David was a Muslim, and the faith and the religion that he preached was Islam. Noah was a Muslim. Joseph was a Muslim. Solomon was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. But now how can this be? What do I mean when I say this? What's, when I make these claims, or when somebody makes these claims that Jesus was a Muslim, when can I, how can this be? How is this possible? Because Islam developed in the 6th century. Well, when you look at the term Muslim from the Quranic perspective, again and again, the concept is inherently generic. And I'll give you an example in Surah, um, and, I'll, and I'll read the Arabic just to prove the point. In Surah 3, um, verse 67, it says, "Ma kan Ibrahim Yahudiyan wala Nasraniyan wala kin kan Hanifam Muslim." And Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian. In other words, because his terms developed later, but he was of those who was true in faith, and he submitted his will to the will of God. That's what the Quranic translation is. But in Arabic, in describing that quality of submission, the word in Arabic is Hanifam Musliman. So, in other words, if one were to transliterate the verse as opposed to translating it, what the Quran in fact states that Abraham was in fact a Muslim. But does this mean that he spoke Arabic and that he called himself Muslim? No, not at all. But Muslim in the sense that it was the same faith and it was the quality of submitting his will to the will of God. One can go further, Surah 3 verse um, 52, referring to the disciples of Jesus, when Jesus found unbelief on their part, he said, who will be my helpers? my sisters through the work of God, said the disciples, we are the helpers to the work of God. We believe in God, and do thou bear witness that we surrender our will to the will of God. Now in Arabic, the word in Arabic is washhad bi'anna muslimun, which means if one were to transliterate this verse as opposed to translating it, the disciples of Jesus are saying, bear witness that we are Muslims. Now, does this mean that they spoke Arabic or that they went out proclaiming that they are Muslims? No, not at all. And so the point is that the term Muslim and the term Islam, when the contemporaries during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the companions or people who we'd call the Sahaba, when they heard the term Muslim and when they heard the term Islam, they didn't understand it in a kind of a historically um, circumscribed sense as we would understand it today like some form of social club. Like, for example, when you think about a Jew, you have a certain mental image. When you think about a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, we all create an event and erect artificial constructs where we place people and attribute certain labels to them. But the term Muslim, and in fact Islam, is not a label. It cannot be viewed as a label. It in fact is the natural state, as the Quran would identify, the deen al-fitra, the natural state that a man has to be where he surrenders his will to the will of God. So by extension, it would mean that the sun, the stars, the solar system, uh, the way the animal kingdom operates, everything that is in accordance with the divine will can be said to be in a state of Islam. And from that perspective, man is also called upon to be in that particular state. At a physical level, yes, he is. He is in a state of Islam. His respiratory systems, the way he breathes, the way he talks, all this is in accordance with the divine will. But consciously or subconsciously, he may choose to detract from surrendering himself to that particular will. And so when we use the term Islam, and when we, at least, you know, conventionally, we use labels and we use terms to, we appropriate for each other, but when we understand the term Islam and the, the, the word Muslim, as it is occurring in the Quran, we find that it is far more broader than what is basically uh, meant to sometimes purport to be seen. In Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 136, we would then argue that based on that premise, there would be no distinction between all messengers. So it says the proclamation of the Prophet, say ye, we believe in God and the revelation given to us, which is the Quran, this book, and that given to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all the prophets from their Lord, we make no difference between one and another, and we bow to God in submission. And in parenthesis, Islam, because that's how it is in Arabic. So, what then happens to Judaism, and what happens to Christianity, and how do we view these? How, how, how do we then interact with them? Well, I would argue that, again, at a fundamental level, 
all purport to share one fundamental concept, belief in God as a supreme being, as a supreme deity. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, you all are probably familiar with the Shema. Shema, Israelu Adonai, Ilahainu Adonai Echad. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One referring to the one God, Echad. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, when somebody came to Jesus and asked him, what's the first of all commandments? He repeated word for word what was mentioned by Moses a thousand years before, where he said, Shema Israelu Adonai Ilahainu Adonai Echad. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad, one and only. 600 years later, you have a Christian deputation from Najran, that's in southern Arabia. They come to visit the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, and they spend three days and three nights in the mosque of the Prophet. They live in the mosque, they eat in the mosque, and they sleep in the mosque, and over and above that, they engage in a form of religious discourse with the Prophet. And at some point in time, they question him now, what is your concept of God? And as if he presses his spiritual buttons, but the revelation comes to him and he says, Qul huwallahu ahad, say he is God, the one and only. Now, in referring to God as being one and only in Arabic, the word used is ahad. In Hebrew and in all Semitic languages, in Hebrew as a sister language to Arabic, the word used is ikhad. So ikhad and ahad is effectively the same thing, with the exception, of course, if, um, would be with the way you pronounce. Ikhad, ahad, linguistically the same, almost identical, but effectively point to the same uh, oneness of God. And so in the fundamental Zen of the teachings of Moses, Jesus, and all the other prophets, we would say that there's not an iota of difference. And so we would argue that Islam is a culmination, the fulfillment of the teachings of all the prophets of God brought into one and into its finality and into its particular conclusion. Now, one needs to argue then, on that basis, what about Judaism? I mean, are these not now legitimate religions, and I would argue, of course, they are. But then how, how do we as a Muslim, with, with what I have mentioned, how do I relate to the label of being called a Jew? Well, on one level, we as Muslims can also appropriate the label and call ourselves Jews in many respects. But if you talk about the historical development of the word Judaism, Jew, Judah, these terms develop much later in history. For example, Judaism comes from the root word Huda, Jehuda, Judea. The story goes, uh, according to some uh, um, narrations, is that Judah had descendants who were known as the children of Judah. And they settled in a land or a place called Judea. And people on the outside, in describing the religious beliefs, they proclaimed that the religion followed by the children of Judah in Judea is in fact Judaism. And so from that perspective, we would argue that Judaism is not a term that was used by Moses. He never said, well, my religion is Judaism. If he was here, we would argue that his religion would be the religion of surrender or submission to the will of God. And in Arabic, in Arabic, that word is in fact Islam. So can you see, there's a distinction between labels, there's a distinction between what the actual practice is. What about um, Christianity? Could I be a Christian? Well, again, on one level, yes, I can be a Christian. And I have no problem calling myself Christian. If by Christian you mean one who follows Christ, I have no problem with that. But the term itself, Christian, the very first time it was heard was in at Antioch in the book of Acts where the disciples of Christ were called Christians at Antioch for the very first time. It was not a term that was used by Jesus himself. It comes from the Greek word Christos, which is basically a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Moshiach or Messiah, the anointed one, in reference to Christ. So today we have religions of the world, Buddhism, Hinduism from the land of Hind, India, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, um, Shintoism, Confucianism. These are labels. And because of the fact that the classical Orientalists writing about Islam knew that Islam and the term Muslim could not in reality be understood as labels, they invented a term in describing the religious beliefs of Muslims. And what did they call it? Mohammedanism and the religion of the followers of Muhammad, who are Mohammedans. You can call that a label. You are a Mohammedan, and therefore you are a follower of the religion 
which is called Mohammedanism. That's a label. But in actual fact, Islam, which is neither a label nor something that you can basically circumscribe it or limit it, is far more broader than what we effectively see from that perspective. And I think it's hopeful and, and understanding, and, and it's, it's important that we basically uh, see it from this perspective. Otherwise, we're going to have a constant confusion in terms of where we say. So some, uh, someone who is a Muslim or someone in order to understand Islam at, a, at its primary level, we need to understand that Muslim is not a label and Islam is not some sort of social club. Rather, from the Quranic perspective, it is a call to man to return, to return to the natural way, to return to the original message, which we believe has been the message sent down by God from Adam right up until the last and final prophet. Having said that, how do we then view ourselves in today's? Because in today's time, we do unfortunately have labels. Muslims understand Muslims as a group of people who call themselves Muslims. Christians understand Christians as people who probably belong either to the uh, Catholicism, subscribe to Catholicism, or obviously the Protestant variety um, in terms of what exists in the world today. Are there anything that we could agree upon? Well on the personality of Christ, there can be an agreement, more so than what Jews would do. We, for example, would believe that Jesus Christ is one of the mightiest messengers of God. We would believe that he is indeed the Messiah. Messiah simply means the Christ, the anointed one. We believe that he performed many miraculous deeds. We believe the Quran uh, testifies to the immaculate conception of Jesus Christ which in the 80s, if you heard of people like Bishop Jenkins and a couple of the individuals from the Anglican Church or the, uh, the Anglican Church in England, they rejected. And a lot of the kind of modern critical scholars have rejected all these notions. We are basically agreeing to that. We believe in his annunciation. We believe that God, in fact, has exalted Jesus. And as one can argue, um, our late founder, the late Ahmed Didat, made a claim. He said, no Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. Now, there are slight differences on the end of his life, but even there, there are fundamental agreements. And so from that perspective, we would argue that Jesus is our prophet. We believe he is a mighty messenger of God. We believe he is one sent by God. We believe he was vouchsafed with revelation, but we do not believe he was God or was indeed the begotten Son of God. Now, I'm not so sure about the theology here in South Africa, but certainly in England and um, in the 80s and the part of the 90s, particularly within the Anglican Church, there was a movement in terms of which one could still be a Christian and accept the historical personage of Jesus Christ as a moral exemplification of deity but not necessarily subscribe to the idea that he's almighty God in the absolute sense. And as a Muslim, we have absolutely no problem with that. You accept him as a representative of God, you accept him as someone sent by God, but not someone who was God in the flesh in the absolute sense. Perhaps God in the sense of making a God to the people as God made uh, Pharaoh. He said, I will make thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. So from that perspective, I could argue that even on this major difference that we sometimes have with many of the mainline Protestant churches, amongst the Anglican churches, there is a movement in terms of moving away from this idea of the absolute deification of Jesus Christ, rather viewing Jesus as a moral exemplification of the excellence of deity, as opposed to him being almighty God. And that's basically um, something that has emerged recently. There's a book uh, written by John Hick, who was also a member of the Church of England. He wrote a book called The Myth of God Incarnate, and the idea where he put forth the kind of evolved and developing Christology as you move from the earlier Gospels, Mark, to Matthew, to Luke, to John, and you see a higher, more developed Christology that is emerging at a later point in time. But that's, of course, something we can, we can debate on on that particular issue. If that is the case, then, how do we view Jesus' mission? Well, even though we accept him as our prophet, as our message, and we would follow him, 
we would, at one, we would argue that his mission was primarily to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. And when you open and have a cursory glance at the New Testament, you find that evident, for example, in Matthew 25, 24, he says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Matthew 10, 5, 6, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so uh, we have the famous story of the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7, verse 26. And so in contrast to that, we would argue that Whilst Jesus' mission was limited, we would argue that the prophet Muhammad was sent as a mercy to all nations and to all humanity, and it's mentioned in Surah 7, verse 158, say, meaning Muhammad is meant to say, O men, I am sent unto you all as the apostle of God to whom belongeth the dominion of the heavens and the earth. There is no God but he. And so Islam would argue that it would be a denial of the universal providence of God to assert that prophets were raised in one nation only. God is the Lord, the cherisher, sustainer of all the worlds. We believe in one universal message. And Islam and gives complete guidance, we would argue, for all aspects and conditions of life, individual as well as social, national as well as timeless, that the earlier prophets had attempted to establish but had failed. You look at the prophets, Jonah. These were mighty men of what happened to them. And so the prophet Muhammad universalized the content of the earlier prophets by cutting out those aspects that are particularistic, meaning something which was inherently geographic, he universalized it. He was not sent just simply to Arabs, and the language and the stylistic rendering of the Quran is always in universalist tones. So if you open the book, the Quran, you won't find a passage or a verse or a phrase which says, O Muslims, or um, O Muslim people. You'd constantly find the assertion, O you who believe, O oh, humanity, O oh, people of the book, O oh, you have accepted faith. O oh, humanity, we created you from a single pair and made you into nations and tribes that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other. Very the most exalted of you in the sight of God is he who is most righteous in conduct. So in other words, you can't claim spiritual exaltation. No one can claim any form of superiority on the basis of class, color, race, gender, or economic prosperity, the only level of exaltation in the sight of God is your spiritual worth in His sight. And that basically allows you to effectively make that particular claim. And what does Jesus say? The Quran does in fact testify that Jesus in fact, in Surah Saf, chapter 61, just to paraphrase it, there is a verse in the Quran which says that Jesus somehow or the other prophesied the coming of Ahmed, of coming of the praised one, of someone that was to come after him. And that's the Islamic belief that Jesus foretold the coming or the advent of Muhammad. Now from the Muslim perspective, how do we understand this? Or could we find any form of historical parallels in the scriptures of other faiths and other communities? Well, we could argue that if you look at the Gospel of John, in the 16th chapter, I believe I think it's verse 12, you'd, for example, read the expression where Jesus tells the disciples, I have yet many things to say unto you. I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, God had given Jesus guidance to guide humanity till doomsday. But the people, his immediate contemporaries, were not fit to receive the message. So he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, shall come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, meaning he cannot speak of his own accord. But what things ever shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he will declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. Now, conventionally that's been understood to be the comforter, but if the comforter is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is indeed God. But here the verse speaks about whatsoever shall he hear, that shall he speak unto you. In other words, there's clearly some degree of subordination from what he's receiving. So it could not be the Holy Spirit. And so we would argue from the Islamic perspective, theologically at least, that taking into account what is contained in the Quran and juxtaposing it with what's contained in the Gospel of John, you clearly see a parallel. Who glorifies Jesus today? Who praises him? In Arabia, in the desert, does it make sense that Muhammad, a man, an unlettered man, sent to Arabs who had ridiculed him, 
Why would he, for example, go out of his way to praise a Jewess Mary, the mother of Jesus, and proclaim to an unbelieving Arab nation that not his mother, not his daughter, not his wife, but a woman from another nation is described in the Quran as the best amongst all women. Does that make sense? And so a Muslim would argue that he had no choice in the pronouncements. He was purely a recipient and dictating what was indeed true. And that would be a classical example of ridicule to him, but he made these particular proclamations and pronouncements. In contrast to the existing charges and blasphemous allegations that you had, for example, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, where Jesus was described as the illegitimate child of Mary, God forbid being raped by a Roman soldier. These are the kind of calumnies that were existing at that particular time in relation to Jesus. And yet Islam came and condemned that. And yet, historically speaking, from the time of the Crusades in the Middle Ages, it was viewed as the Antichrist. How is that possible? How is that possible when the stature and uh, the uh, nature of Jesus is given the highest um, level in the Quran? To the extent that Jesus himself is mentioned more times in the Quran than the Prophet Muhammad. Does that mean make Jesus more important than Muhammad? Not at all. Because Moses himself is mentioned 120 times in the Quran. Does that make Moses more important than Jesus and Muhammad? Not at all. But just simply to correct past um, ideas that may have been circulating around, there was a degree of emphasis where the Quran took a corrective approach in terms of sharing these truths and correcting past um, uh, wrongs that basically um, existed on these religious personalities and prophets. Now, we want to move on, and I don't want to take too much of your time. I want to have some degree of interaction as well. But when people talk about Islam, as the good reverend pointed out yesterday when I chatted to him, these are the kind of themes that immediately prop up. Violence, position of women, jihad, sharia, ISIS, al-Qaeda. All these can be topics discussed on their own. But just to give one particular example, the position of woman or the status of woman. In Arabian, in the backwaters of Arabian society, women were regarded as subhuman chattels. Daughters were viewed as accursed and were buried alive. Women had absolutely no, in a general sense, in a patriarchal society, had absolutely no sense to entitlement, with the exception of a few, no sense to property, no sense to, um, no right to property rights. And from that particular perspective, we would argue that for the very first time with the advent of Islam, you had a position whereby women had the right to obtain education. Women had a right to own the independent property and inherit. Now, of course, there are differences in inheritance laws. We can, of course, explore that. They had the right to work to earn money. They had the equality of reward for equal deeds, unlike the idea where people had this myth that women had no souls. They had to write they, to express their opinion and be heard. Amazingly enough, excuse me, that in the time of the uh, Khulafa Rashidin, or the Caliphate, during the time of Omar, the second Caliph, you had him wanting to introduce certain um, judicial amendments in the mosque, which was back then, very much an interactive space for both men and women. He wanted to introduce certain judicial amendments. And you had a woman standing up and censuring him. Now, what did he say? He could have said, are you a woman? Sit down, shut up, and listen to me. No. He said that this woman is right, and I am wrong. Now, that is unheard of in the 6th century or the 7th century. Totally unheard of. The ability to heard, be heard and communicate one's views. The right to divorce the right to custody of their children after divorce, the right to leadership in society. In Surah 4, verse 19, O you who believe, you are forbidden to inherit women, this was the old Arab practice, against their will, nor should you treat them with any form of harshness. On the contrary, live for them on a footing of kindness and equality, and the word in Arabic is ma'roof. Ma'roof means equal, on, on, on any kind of an equal standing, on the same standing. 
What about slavery? We would argue that one of the first systems that took steps to leading to the total abolition of slavery was Islam. Now we know of people like William Wilberforce and many movements in modern day Christendom which led to the elimination of slavery. But what you find more explicitly in the Quran, the explicit declaration that slavery, the recognition, was an inherent evil. What will explain to thee the path that is steep? It is a liberation of slaves, the giving of food in the day of privation to the orphan with claims of relationship or the indigent down in the dust. One could go on. It's not righteousness that you turn your faces towards the east or the west in praise of God. But it is righteousness to believe in God in the last day, to spend out of substance, out of love for him, for God, and for the love for the kin, for your orphans, for the needy, for the wayfarer, and more importantly, in Arabic, wasailina wa firqab, for the ransom of slaves, removing the yoke from the, those who are under some degree of bondage, rakaba, the ransoming of slaves. So it basically points you out to that particular direction. Some have argued, according to Wilfred Cantwell Smith, that whilst Christianity in recent years has moved towards a social gospel, Islam has been a social gospel from the start. And from the true Islamic perspective, Islam in fact aims to build a social order upon the principles of equality, justice, and peace. And that's what we basically are calling for. We're in fact calling for peace. The Quran says in Surah 2 verse 206, O you who believe, Ya ladina amanu, udkhulu fi silmi kafa, enter into peace completely. The word in Arabic is silm. It's a call to peace in times of warfare. This is the path of your Lord. Those who take for them is heed. Those who take heed for them is the abode of peace with their Lord, and He's a protector of what they were doing. And God calls you to the abode of peace and leads whom He wills to the straight path. Surah 8, verse 61 When warfare becomes inevitable, what happens? If they incline to peace, you should also incline to it and put your trust in God. Verily, He is the all hearer, the all knower. If they withdraw from you and fight not against you and offer you peace, then Allah, God, has opened up no way for you against them. And so, from that perspective, we could argue that Islam, in fact, calls universally for peace. Islam, in fact, leads the road and the effective guideline. It sets down essential guidelines to peace. How then do we explain terror in the world. And I'm going to wrap up with this. Where's our good Reverend Furi? How long do I have? I'll just leave you with a few points and then we can open the discussion um, and probably entertain a few questions. If that is indeed the case, if I'm, am I just simply pro providing some form of Walt Disney form of Islam? Because to some that would basically seem, it may, may appear to be a very much of a watered down version of Islam, a sort of a politically correct version of Islam. But I would argue that in analyzing the religious beliefs of any community, it is always paramount and fundamental to go to the primary sources. And if you find something in the primary sources that is reprehensible, certainly deal with it. But if you find something in the primary sources that cannot be justified, or you find actions of people that cannot be essentially justified in the primary sources, then you need to question actions of people and the way individuals behave and represent themselves in different parts of the world. These studies have been conducted very recently. An individual called Mark Sageman, he was a Polish-born psychiatrist, 61 years old. He worked for the CIA in the 80s and closely worked with the Afghan Mujahideen in the early 1980s, who were back then allies of the United States. In fact, there was a front in New York City called the Al-Kifa Afghan Refugee Center, where people were being basically recruited to go and fight the godless Soviet Russians uh, that had just invaded Afghanistan accordingly. He wrote a number of books, was called by the 9-11 Commission Report, and he analyzed the biographies um, uh, of several hundred terrorists. And when questioned, what was the role of terrorism? What was the role of violence? He says religion has a role, but it's a role of justification. It's not why they do this or why young people go there. ISIS members, this is in the context of the phenomenon of this creature or death cult called ISIS. He says, are using religion to advance a political vision rather than using politics to advance a religious vision. To give themselves a bit more legitimacy, they use Islam as a justification. It's not about religion. It's about identify, identity. You identify with the victims, with the guys being killed by your enemies. Another book, 
Ali H. Safan, he wrote a book called The Black Banners, The Inside Story of 9-11 and the War Against Al-Qaeda. He says, when I first began interrogating Al-Qaeda members, I found that these people could quote Bin Laden's sayings by heart. I knew far more of the Quran than they did. And some, in fact, barely knew classical Arabic, the language of the Quran. Far from being religious zealots, a large number of these terrorists or those involved do not, in fact, practice their faith regularly. Many lack religious literacy and could, in many respects, be regarded as religious novices. This is the assessment that they are effectively making. And look at these individuals. This is someone called Jihadi John, Muhammad Amwazi. Uh, and if you look at his background, raised and educated in the UK, described as Jihadi John after John Lennon, a kind of a pun on John Lennon. He was described by two British medics who met him in Africa as an adrenaline junkie and had drinking expeditions in Africa with a German friend of his immediately before joining ISIS. That goes to show his religious uh, religiosity. Muhammad Ahmed and Yusuf Sarwar, two British men from Birmingham, they were convicted of terrorism charges in 2014. When the MI5 looked at their past material and books that they were looking at, they discovered that prior to moving to Syria, they had bought copies of the books called Islam for Dummies and the Quran for Dummies prior to their departure. Now, who would read that? Who ingrained in their faith? I mean, these are introductory books. I can get the Bible for Dummies. At a very elementary level, you want to learn about the Bible. Quite educational. But what does it say about these individuals? In 2005, eight, a classified briefing note on radicalization prepared by MR5's Behavioral Science Unit that deals with radicalization in the community. This was reported by the Guardian newspaper. They made the following observation. They said, far from being religious zealots, a large number of those involved in terrorism do not practice their faith regularly. Many lack religious literacy and could be regarded as religious novices. And the report went on to say that a large number of these individuals had a high propensity for drug taking, drinking alcohol, and visiting prostitutes. That's very Islamic. Like Muhammad Atta, where was he? The alleged 9-11 hijacker. A few days before 9-11, where was he? Allegedly in a strip club. Now, and then they were finding Qurans all over. All over, you just find Qurans, you just pick up, as if these were the kind of um, Gideon equivalent of the Qurans. You know the Gideon Bibles that you basically see in your hotels? <laughs> what is going on here? Is there something that we are not essentially seeing? And, and one could go on. One could effect, these are the individuals. One could go on. Mossad impersonator, Muhammad Atta. This is a meme on, on the internet. Relished pork shops, strip clubs, hard liquor, drugs, gambling excursions. The radical Muslim hijackers led similar lifestyles. The night before 9-11, the story goes, they got drunk in a bar and left an alcohol-soaked Quran on their table. We don't know if that's true, but if it is true, then it tells you about the so-called religious motivations of these individuals. And we need to be collectively fighting against this. Fighting it against extremism from the right, as now just now in Charleston, right now, just a day or two ago, I think yesterday, there's attack by the far-right extremists. There's, there's extremism on all ends, on all spectrums, and we are called to take a balanced approach. And believing communities should stand with each other in fighting all forms of oppression, whether it's the United States bombing children in Iraq or Afghanistan, or extremists going and blowing themselves up, believing they're acting in the name of God. We should be standing up against this kind of injustice and confronting the social ills of our particular time. One last point, and I'm going to end on this, on suicide terrorism. That's what um, Reverend Furi asked me yesterday, that people would like to know what's the relationship between suicide terrorism and Islam. This is Robert Pape, uh, a professor of political science based at the University of Chicago. He wrote two books. One was called Bombing to Win, referring to aggressive imperial activity in the world, and Dying to Win. In his book, Dying to Win, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism, he says, the data shows that there is little connection between suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism, or Islam. Rather, what nearly all suicide terrorist attacks have in common is a specific secular and strategic goal. A secular and strategic goal. Who were the first suicide killers in the 20th century? Who? The Japanese kamikaze. Were, were, they, were they Islamic terrorists? Were they Islamic fundamentalists? No. These are tools which are used by individuals, some fighting what they believe to be a legitimate enterprise, others just simply engaging in a form of 
blind um, mass murder or killing of individuals. And so it's important at the end of the day, I'm not going to go any further, but it's important at the end of the day that we understand where we stand in relation with each other and how we view each other. There is, as I stated at the outset, much misunderstanding from both sides of the equation, I would argue. Amongst Muslims, there are many that have a misunderstanding of those from the Christian perspective. From the Christian side, there's also, and indeed the secular side, a lot of misunderstanding on what Islam is and on what Muslims basically stand for. And I would argue that even though we may not necessarily agree with each other theologically, the fact that um, I as a Muslim or you as a Christian could come to a mosque or meet to a church and address you on these issues leads one to the belief that there is indeed much hope in terms of how our communities could in, could in fact relate to each other. That we seek to understand each other, that we seek to hear what the other side says, not just simply to take approach of misunderstanding, misrepresentation, and continuing the trajectory of hate, which effectively leads to hostility, and sometimes, in certain instances, even warfare. I'd leave you with an example um, in the 50s. You've heard of the Mau Mau. And the Mau Mau were in Kenya. And Kenya, as I understand, at some point in time was an English protectorate. But at some point in time, in the British press, I don't know if it was called Fleet Street, there were satirical images of the Mau Mau being depicted where they were described as these big black monsters with dreadlocks and you know the, the kind of classical archetype that you would see, uh, stereotype that you would see, for example, in the writings of Edgar Rice Burroughs <laughs> and Edgar Allan Poe, Tarzan of the Apes. You'd see these monstrous black apes. And what happened? It had a, a, a process of systematically desensitizing the British public. And what eventually happened is that up to 7,000 Mau Mau were brutally murdered. And there was absolutely nothing that was said eventually. Just like the Jews in Nazi Germany, what happened? Prior, subsequently to the Weimar Republic and just prior to the rise of the Third Reich, what happened? There was a systematic propagandist campaign of stigmatization, of dehumanization, of stereotyping of the worst kind of Jewish people, that these are blood-sucking vampires coming to take over our land and coming to take over European society. And what happened? A nation that was so sophisticated, the Germans, that had basically had individuals like Guith and Beethoven, that nation was systematically brainwashed into following Hitler on his mad quest leading to the Second World War and the horrors and atrocities that we see in history. And so what I am saying is as communities, there is just a split second where we can go back to that. Just a split second. Look at what's happening in European society today. Look at the rise of the far right in parts of Europe, in the United States, in different parts of the world, where people are seeing each other with these kind of uh, bigoted lenses in the 21st century, something which nobody would have thought would uh, repeat itself. But history has a nasty way of repeating itself, unfortunately. And unless we don't um, take upon the initiative of choosing to understand each other, love each other, and of course use the best that our fates can uh, basically possess, internalizing the best aspects of our fates in creating a kind of unity, harmony, and as opposed to uh, one of discord and hostility, unless we basically go back to our fates and take the best that our fates can offer, we're going to find ourselves living in a society where we're going to have this constant um, flow trajectory into anarchy and eventually we may even end up destroying ourselves. And so I thank you for that, Reverend. I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity and allowing our Muslim brothers and, sis uh, and in Christian, very few parts of the world, by the way, you can have this kind of gathering. And so South Africa from that perspective is unique, I would argue. And let us continue the discussion and let us take this to the next level. And I thank you for your time.
Yusuf, thank you for sharing with us um, about Islam and reminding us that there are so many points of departure that are similar, if not the same as ours, and that our goal at the end of the day as a faith organization is the same, and that is to create a better world, a world where the people in the world and the world itself knows God's love and that they are loved by God. This morning I spoke about the Charter for Compassion. It is a charter that has been signed by Christian, Jew, and Muslim alike. So in that sense, we are all working towards the same thing. And my hope is that as we've started dialoguing with yourselves and with the Jewish community, maybe the three faiths together can work together to make a better Berea. Certainly. I'm so thank, thank you, you for that. Are you willing to take a few questions sure, sure. from we the can, floor? Sure, we can open the floor for a discussion. Um, I'm going to try and keep it short so that we still have time to fellowship over whatever's left at the table there. If you do want to uh, ask a question, please raise your hand and Seppo will bring your microphone. Any over there, Seppo? Good evening. Good evening. My name's Annie Weber. Um, thank you very much. And which was shocker, I'm a very proud owner of a very beautiful Quran which I inherited from my grandfather, who was an attorney in the Free State, which you know was very controversial from those days, Boer War. So I've read quite a lot. And the things of Christ and things, I kept on being more and more astounded. But all that said, um, just things that everybody points fingers at, and I've been blessed to work. I worked in Amlazi with a lot of Muslim people there, so my own staff, so I feel very blessed in my life. Um, things, and just jumping far ahead, using children for suicide bombers, and you were saying like the madness of the alcoholics and these kamikaze chaps, just that thing that you hear, in a way, you don't have to answer it, but it's, it's just the thing, obviously. And then the other thing people gossip about and say, well, they do it because in their faith, they're going to have 20,000 virgins when they get to heaven or wherever they're going. And just to say, personally, I have always been agonized by Guantanamo Bay. Okay. Thank you. Just on one point, on the issue of suicide, that just comes to mind. There's a verse of the Quran which says, Wala taktulu anfusakum. Do not kill yourselves, not destroy yourselves. In fact, there's a hadith, some have questioned the authenticity, which states that if a person engages in wanton suicide, then the sort of penalty for that in the afterlife is that he repeats that, that he goes through the turmoil of repeating his actions in the hereafter. So suicide generally is viewed quite... Um, um, condemned in the strongest of terms of Islam, and certainly suicide bombing, which not just targets oneself, but others, and in many instances, innocent civilians, uh, would also be, from a theological point of view, condemned. But thank you for that, ma'am. Hi, my name is Noctula. Just forgive me, sir, if this question is coming from me, misunderstanding what you said earlier. But you, you said something about the relationship between like, Islam and identity. From what you said, I got the feeling that maybe Islam is more like a practice in relation to your spiritual commitment to God, not identity per se. I, I got lost a little bit there because if we all share that fundamental belief that there is only one God and only one God, maybe somewhere in my Christian life, I am a Muslim too in a way. Islam is not a religion in a conventional sense. You know, you've got religions of the world, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam sometimes is categorized in that. And I said that from the Quranic point of view, it cannot be viewed as religion in that conventional sense. It's far more broader. Now, there are certainly certain aspects that come with surrendering yourself to the will of God. And this obviously takes a form of a practical exemplification in terms of certain acts and rituals and forms of worship that accompany that. But to just give you an example in terms of the broadness of this, if you look at um, 
studies of the anthropologists in the 1920s when they went to Australia and they studied the belief people of people like the Kopoko tribes of Papua who never met civilized man until the 1930s or the Aborigines of Australia, Australia and the Maoris and those communities that never actually came into contact with civilized man in inverted commas. And they studied and analyzed what did these people believe before someone came and told them what to believe. And you would see that it is in fact Islam in everything but name. In other words, they don't say Islam, they don't call themselves Muslim, but the faith is one. They had a concept called Atnatu. You know, they call God Atnatu. Now, Atnatu in the Maori language means one who does not have the call of nature. Meaning from their primitive perspective, any God, any person that was a God that ate food and that was subject to the sensory perception that we as individuals have and is also subject to the call of nature cannot in fact be God. So at one level, they had a far more superior concept of God than those individuals and people like Captain James Cook and so on that came to basically colonize them and take over their land at that particular level. But of course, going further, when you accept these particular aspects of self-surrender to God, there are certain practical examples in terms of how you can exemplify the self-surrender. And so you would find the five essential pillars. And of course, you would find, for example, the declaration of faith. The declaration of faith is that you believe that there is one and only God, that there is none other worthy of worship except one God, and that Muhammad is the last and final messenger sent by God amongst all the prophets that have been sent down by God from time immemorial. You accept, for example, the five daily acts of worship. And the five daily acts of worship are a practical exemplification of how you can surrender yourself to the will of God. Because just simply saying you submit yourself to the will of God is just simply an arbitrary concept. But how do you surrender yourself? There is a kink in the human cranium that if you, if you physically engage in something, then psychologically it can impact on your particular mind. So when you physically go and prostrate to God in worship five times a day, at a, at, a, at, a, at a certain level, you are basically internalizing that aspect of self-surrender to God. And we would argue from an Islamic perspective, again, that there is nothing unique about that form of worship, because we can argue that throughout history, that's how prophets of God prayed in general, the actual salah, not necessarily in detail, but in principle. You read cursorily, Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. Daniel, in the sixth chapter, in the verse 10, it says that he opened his chambers, faced Jerusalem, and he fell down on his face three times a day to God. In Islam, the earlier uh, period, the Qibla, or the focal point of direction for worship was indeed Jerusalem. Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are told in the 26th chapter of Matthew, he says, he went a little further and fell on his face, fell on his face, just as we fall, and said, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And what is Islam? Submitting your will to the will of God. And so from that perspective, we would argue he is in fact a Muslim. So I, I, I appreciate the fact that you've identified um, the thrust and the theme in terms of um, where I'm coming from. And perhaps we can continue the discussion much later. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Yusuf. Yusuf what would be the Islamic rulings or Islamic perspective regarding uh, churches, synagogues, rabbis and priests, how do we have to treat, or how does a Muslim have to honor or treat a pastor or rabbi or synagogue or church? There is something which is called the Pact of Omar. And more than that, there is something which is explicitly in the Quran, which speaks about the protection of religious places of worship. I believe it's in the 28th chapter of the Quran, verse 60, subject to correction, that if God did not basically um, allow certain people to protect others or to engage in a form of a defensive struggle against other people, then you would find effectively that churches, monasteries, and synagogues, where the name of God is indeed much remembered, would effectively be destroyed. So here you have a situation that churches, synagogues, religious communities that are in an Islamic state would be under direct protection
by Muslims and under Muslim rule. And you have a classic example, for example, during the time of Hazrat Umar, when he went to a particular place in Jerusalem, and he was asked and to make the worship, the salah, the form of worship, the salah, what we engage in salah. And he was offered the church precincts to make his place of worship to salah, to engage in the act of worship. And he refused to do so. And why did he refuse to do so? He refused to do so on the basis that perhaps subsequent generations in seeing him engaging in this place of, in a form of worship in a church, subsequent generations may see this act as a form of defilement and a justification for defilement, and therefore it would entitle them to destroy the church. And so out of reverence and deference to that, he basically did not use that church as a form of prayer. He prayed actually outside that particular church. And in history, historically speaking, you find that Islamic churches, I'm sorry, churches, synagogues, and other places of worship have been under Muslim protection. In fact, there is something which is called the jizya. The jizya is the uh, poll tax which is paid in lieu of military conscription. And that poll tax basically indicates that if you are a citizen living under Islamic rule, at least from a historical perspective, then if the state or the community or the land is under immediate attack, then effectively you would be called to defend it. But in certain instances, if you do not defend it or you refuse to defend it, then you are to pay what is called a poll tax, lesser than the zakat, in lieu of military conscription. However, you find that priests, rabbis, religious leaders, monks, they were basically forbidden to pay the poll tax, and in fact they were exempt from any form of obligation to the particular state on the basis that they were religious individuals and their rights had to in fact be respected. And so historically speaking, you find that when Jews were persecuted under Queen Ferdinand and um, under Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, where did they run to? They ran to Muslim lands. They ran to Muslim countries. Therefore, even today, prior to 1948, you had a large proportion of Sephardic Jews, non-European Jews, that were living side by side with the Palestinians, with the Arabs. So there is much difference in what history actually tells us, what the Quran in fact prescribes, and what people may obviously wish to propagandize and present in terms of the falsehood that you see around here. So religious people are respected. Not only are they respected, but their places of worship are in fact respected. And you are forbidden to in fact destroy their places of worship. Rather, as the Quran testifies, in certain instances, you are called upon to defend and to struggle against those people out there who may want to engage in the destruction of all forms of religious worship. Effectively, what it would mean that under a true Islamic polity, it would effectively entail the total defending of the idea of the freedom of religious worship. Now, I've seen you've been making a lot of references into the Holy Bible. So my question is, do you read the Holy Bible as Islam's? That's a loaded question because, <laughs> but it's a good question. It's an excellent question because I've indeed made much reference to the Bible and to the, um, indeed, the New Testament and portions of the Old Testament. From a Muslim perspective, again, this is something which is taught at a basic level from the time you're grown up. You're given to believe in the idea that God gave revelation to different communities and nations, and this was given to them in the form of revelation. So historically speaking, we would argue that Moses received what was called the Torah. Torah. Torah and Torah are linguistically the same thing. He was vouchsafed with the revelation called the Torah. David received what we would call the Zabur. Jesus received what we would call the Injil, Injil Evangel, or the Gospel. And so we believe and we accept that whatever was received by these particular prophets was indeed from God, and so the integrity and the quality of their messages was indeed unimpeachable. That is the Islamic position. 
Now, what's the Islamic position in relation to the Bible? Well, at a very fundamental level, even though Jews, for example, describe the Torah as a Pentateuch, and Muslims describe the Torah as that which was revealed to Moses, the concept of what constitutes the Torah and the concept of what constitutes the Torah is significantly different. From the Jewish perspective, the Tanakh, or the Pentateuch for that matter, are the five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which are purportedly books written by Moses. The general scholarly consensus today is that these books are more particularly biographical accounts about Jesus, about Moses, as opposed to something that was revealed to Moses. If you get yourself something which is called a Collins Revised Standard Version edition of the Old and the New Testament, in the frontispiece preface, it will give you a list of the books of the Bible. And in many respects, you find books of the Old Testament, some which are written pseudonymously, and some which are indeed written anonymously. So from that perspective, we would argue that what is contained in the existing Bible, what is um, in conformity with the Quranic point of view, we would accept. Um, what goes against the Quranic point of view, we would reject. But we would also agree with the contemporary uh, Christian scholarly consensus on this point, which seems to be on the same level with Islam, is that these books are more particular biographical accounts that were written by scribes over a particular period of time. In respect of the New Testament, you've got the biographical accounts about Jesus uh, written at a particular point in history. Again, the Islamic position would be that whatever was revealed to Jesus was what he preached and communicated, and that what you find here are basically a biographical account about Jesus. If you get a copy of the Red Letter Bible, get a Red Letter Bible, and you look at all the words of Jesus in red, and if you were to eliminate the duplications because you have parallel accounts, you would find that they would not be able to fill in more than two columns in the newspaper because you have duplicate accounts of Jesus' life in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and John. Um, and historically speaking, if you look at the textual reliability of the Scripture, the oldest text of the Old Testament, the Masoretic text, that dates the 10th century of the Common Era, with the exception of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The oldest Bible, um, historically speaking, is the Codex Sinaiticus that dates to the 4th century, about 400 years after Jesus. Um, historically speaking, scholars arduously attempt to reconstruct and engage in a laborious process of textual criticism to determine what could or could not have been said by the writers. So you've got an ideal, which is what we believe, and then you've got what we receive today. And so, um, from our perspective, we would argue that certainly the Word of God can be found there. We don't have a problem in acknowledging that. But at the same time, you can find the Word of the historian, the Word of the scribe, the Word of the redactor. And of course, you have biographical accounts and stories that have been incorporated over a period of time. That's the Islamic position. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Samuel. I'm a pastor. I was a pastor from the United States for... Um, some 35 years working in human rights and working in, uh, wa in Washington, D.C. with U.S. Congress and Uni United Nations. In 2011, I was called to Saudi Arabia to work on a specific project involving the Quran. They wanted to make a new American interpretation of the Quran in modern American English. Well, I didn't know anything about the Quran. I didn't know anything about... Um, about the, uh, pro the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I didn't know anything about uh, Islam. I went not knowing only that I was going to be correcting the English of a new version of the Quran. And I did this for six months. I read it every day, every evening, and every morning I had questions. I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions over a period of six months. When I went, I didn't know the virgin birth, the immaculate conception of Christ was, was mentioned in the Quran. I was shocked. I didn't realize that Jesus was mentioned so often, uh, his miracles. But getting to the question, though, I want to mention that I was raised by a Southern Baptist mother in Jefferson, Georgia, who took me to First Baptist Church every Sunday morning. And she would take children's books from the church library. And one of the books that she read to me over and over again when I was three or four years old 
was called the God of Abraham. And she would tell me, Sammy, you've got to believe in the God of Abraham. There's only one true God. You have to pray to the God of Abraham. So that stayed with me through Christian high school, through Christian university, and three Christian graduate schools. Now, when I started this work on the Quran, some Muslims, well-meaning, told me I had to forget everything I learned about the Bible because I had memorized large portions of the Bible. But then I met one of the chief imams of Mecca, Dr. Saud al-Sharim, and he told me in front of 25 business people, he said, if you want to work in the United States, I wanted to work in human rights again, but I wanted to work, I organized Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. You may see some of the shirts here tonight. He gave me two pieces of advice. This is in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Don't forget the Bible, you need to know the Bible. Study the Bible. Yeah. And the second piece of advice, you need to have good Jewish friends. Now I didn't expect to hear that from an imam in Mecca, but that's what I was told. He's the first member of our advisory board for Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. No, I haven't forgotten the Bible. I study the Bible. I remember the Bible, large portions of the Psalms or the Zabur of David. It's hanging on my wall in, my, in the mosque where I live. I'm very grateful to God for taking me to Saudi Arabia and opening my eyes to so much and to being loved now for six years by my brothers and sisters in Saudi Arabia and who've taught me so much about Islam. Now I speak in churches and synagogues all over the United States and Europe. I just came from Cuba. And um, I have a traveling companion who's with me. His name is Asa. He's my associate. Asa means Jesus. His name is Jesus. Muslims love Jesus so much they name their kids Jesus. And Samuel and Jesus travel throughout the U.S. and Europe now talking about the Bible and the Quran. Thank you for that question. I'm sorry for such a long answer. Thank you. Make this the last question. Thank sure. you. Actually, it's not a question. Our uh, learned uh, pastor mentioned that uh, there was going to be another version of the Quran. I think you were actually referring to the translation, another translation of the Quran. I think, Brother Yusuf, some uh, clarification is needed here, please. Yeah, I, I, think, I think what he was referring to was a subsequent translation of the Quran, not a version. But you use the term version and translations um, um, conventionally. And some would argue, even from the perspective of Christianity today, you know, I know the traditional Muslim apologetic has been different versions of the Bible. In actual fact, you do have different translations of the Bible, sometimes in certain variances. But more particularly from the Quranic point of view, you've got a unanimous text. The text is inherently consistent, so you don't have a case of uh, editing, textual criticism, or discovery of manuscripts where certain verses are not said to be authentic or have to be authenticated. You've got a consistent text, and the difference would obviously be in the inherent translation of the text or the translator's gloss or his interpretation of the verse or passage of the Quran. That would be the essential difference. Thank you for the clarification. And thank you for all of you for attending this. I think um, I'm going to hand it over to the good Reverend. I want to thank him for this opportunity in addressing all of you. And I know on a Sunday night and Saturday nights, people have, um, have, have a lot of things on their mind, and they probably want to go to cinema or have other forms of attraction. But it's good that we have people coming together in a forum of this nature <laughs> and um, uh, basically engaging and discussing on, on something which is very important. In fact, if not the most important thing in our lives, and it's good that we have us uh, in a gathering in a forum of this nature. And you are more than welcome in the future um, at the mosque, uh, at the masajid, and we hope to engage and interact in further discussions. Thank you for your time and opportunity. Yusuf, once again, thank you very much. Thank you also to everybody who came tonight to make it the success it was.
thank you for all the questions, and I'm sure there are many more. So please do continue the discussions over whatever is left of the refreshments. Um, I'm sure we can twist John's arm to wait another half an hour at, uh, or, or, or so. But I am encouraging us to continue the dialogue. And as Yusuf said, we can also visit their place of worship, and I certainly will be doing that, and we will continue the dialogue, not only to understand each other better, but to make Berea and Durban, South Africa, a better place, a place that knows that our Lord is one. Amen. And I want to finish with a blessing that God said to his priests to pray on all the people. So if I may, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We are free to continue our discussion at the back and mill around. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you very much. I think before we go, could we give a round of applause to Reverend Furi for this program? Thank you very much. <laughs> Could I ask everybody please just to come this way so that we've got a bit of a uh, tear to be able to take a photograph? Pastor Fully, Reverend Fully, it's cold this evening, but the event makes me feel warm. <laughs> Likewise, thank, thank you. you so much. Daddy, have you got your camera here? Oh, Would you like to take a photo? One more. Come on. No, the, 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 the tab. You get them for the tab. You can get it.